So what is your identity? That seems like a simple question, but maybe it isn't so simple. I mean, on one level it is. If, for instance, you're at some kind of gathering, some kind of social function, you're meeting new people, you'll probably be asked to identify yourself. That is, you'll be approached by another person who'll tell you his or her name and who will expect you to respond in kind and give your name. And then this other person will ask for more information. They'll say, tell me more about yourself. And at that point in the conversation, you'll be expected to give something about yourself, to identify yourself. Now, traditionally, at least for most of my life, in polite conversation, the way that most people would fill in the blank would be to start by talking about their occupation. Start by talking about what they do for a living. But increasingly, over the last couple of decades or more, that line of thinking has gone by the wayside. Now, if you ask someone to tell you something about themselves, they're more likely to start by telling you their race, their ethnic heritage, their gender, their sexual orientation, and their preferred pronouns. Now, both answers, though, and both lines of questioning have their shortcomings. Because asking someone about their occupation limits your questioning to only kind of one aspect of that person's life. And the postmodern way of talking about identity has more to do with what you are than who you are. And most of the questions actually have things to do, have to do with things that are out of your control. Things that you had nothing to do with, such as your ethnic heritage, your culture, and so on. This is why it's such nonsense. For instance, to talk to young children and, and tell them, just be yourself. That's, you know, that, that This is the message of the latest Pixar and Disney movies. Be yourself. Well, the self isn't inborn. The self isn't something that we discover. The self is something that we create. And it's made by our life experiences. The self is created by the commitments that we make. The self is created by the actions that we take. You know, you've you've heard the story a thousand times. Someone who's a junior in college goes and sees their guidance counselor and says, you know, and I'm going to drop out for a while, and I need to find myself. They never come back and say, I found myself. I was by an exit on I-80. I drove by, and there I was, and by golly, now I know who I am. (laughs) Well, that's because the self isn't somewhere waiting to be found. The self is nowhere waiting to be created. Yes, there's that that spark that's in you. It's not that you're nothing. But what you make of yourself is what you make of yourself. And that's who you are. That's your identity. That's the problem that I see, at least one of the big problems with Uh, People that I talk to say, well, you know, we're going to raise our kids uh, without religion. We're just going to let them decide for themselves. Well, decide what? Between something and nothing? Because what you've been modeling for them for 25 years is that church isn't important to you. You're not being neutral in that situation. You're actually doing something in that situation. And what you're doing is something else, something other than going to church on Sundays. You're doing you know, these, these other things. And you know, when when you when you don't make that a priority, your kids can see that. They see, well, it's not important to you. And they're not even they're not even gonna ask, 
Why should it be important to me? Unless someone that they encounter poses them with the question, some life experience. See, what you do is what you are. What you do is what you believe. You know, I, I, I listen to Jordan Peterson quite a bit, and he has, uh, in recent years, come into faith and declares himself a person of faith. He's a believer in Christ. He's a, a very much a believer in the in the Bible as the Word of God, um, uh, and he's a, a defender of the faith. He's been going into discussions and debates with people of other faiths now. Uh, but for years, when when asked about his faith, and people would say, well, do you believe in God? And he would say, I act like I believe in God. And he says, as far as I'm concerned, that is belief. Because it's what I do that matters. It's not that I'm articulating a certain set of beliefs sort of set a sort of set of, of, of a set of propositions about God. I'm I'm telling you through my behavior that I believe there's an accounting. Now he has since you know modified that, but at the core of what he was saying there, that was never wrong. What you do is what you believe, and that is shaped by exterior things. That's shaped by life experience. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope and the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in that we are under pressure, knowing that such pressures produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And those those pressures, that, that, that word there, uh, uh, that Greek word thlipsis, uh, literally refers to pressure, as in water pressure or air pressure. And he's talking about the, the, the pressures that, that stress on us from the outside. And says it, it's our, our strength against those pressures. That's what builds our character. It's what we do that creates our character. It's what we do that creates the self. External pressures produce characters because they force you to act. This is why I'm so glad about this recent um, Supreme Court decision, returning the decisions about abortion to the states. And I'm not even going to get into the, a discussion about you know the details of abortion. I've given sermons on that. You know what I think about that. The point is, is that the onus for thinking about that and wrestling with those issues is now exactly where it belongs. And that's on the shoulders of the people. For 50 years, we were protected from ever having to think about it seriously or do anything about it seriously. What we said for 50 years, what we said in this country to one another about abortion didn't matter because it was never going to come to a vote. It was being kept from the people by the courts. And we were, we were never going to get to, to speak our minds on it. And now it's come back to the states. And in my opinion, every question on this not only ought to be on the state level, it ought to be in a referendum. <clears throat> I think every citizen should be forced by circumstance to go in and press a lever and say yes or no to this question. 
and however it's framed, whether it's framed with a with a time limit, time frame, whatever, whatever, you know, all those issues about the length and so on, that ought to be on our shoulders. Why? Because it's pressure that builds character. We need to be, we need to be responsible for our decisions. Now, I digress when I talk about that. This is, this is not a, a sermon about abortion. The thing is, is that it isn't what you think. It isn't what you say that matters. It's what you do that matters. That's who you are. The self is created by the commitments that we make. When people call, we get phone calls at the church every now and again. Someone's coming to town. Uh, they are members of the Church of Christ somewhere in Texas or Tennessee or Florida or someplace. And they want to know if we're a bona fide Church of Christ. They want to know if, if, if we meet their standard of orthodoxy. And so they have questions. They want me to call and, and they have questions. And the questions that they, that they want to ask are all about externals. You know, is your singing a cappella? Do you take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Are your services male led? You know, the, these these are the three most important, the th most frequent questions people ask. The, this is what people want to know. Well, why do they want to know that? Well, because what we do is evidence of what we believe. But you know what they don't ask? They don't ask, do you take a collection every Sunday? I think maybe it's one of the questions they should ask. I want to talk to you about a, a story from the Old Testament. It has to do with identity being caught up in what we do, and specifically in what we do in regard to our giving. Numbers 32, starting in verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had a very large number of livestock. So when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock, the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses, Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, The land which the Lord conquered before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants, to us as our property. Do not take us across the Jordan. Now Moses wasn't very happy about this. Moses said to the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben, Should your brothers go to war? While you remain here? And why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing over into the land which the Lord has given them? That's what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eskel and saw the land, they discouraged the sons of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger burned on that day, and he swore, saying, None of the men who came up from Egypt, from twenty years old and upward, shall see the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. For they did not follow me fully, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and the Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they have followed the Lord fully. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And it made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord came to an end. Now, behold, you have risen up in your father's place, born of sinful men, and add still more to the burning anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once more leave them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all these people. So Moses is projecting quite a bit on these guys. They're saying, look, we don't, we don't need to cross the Jordan. You know, we'll just stay here on this eastern bank. We'll take this land. And, you know, you guys go. And Moses says, nothing doing. Because if you don't go, God's going to punish all of us. If I let you do that, this is, this is not going to end well. 
Then they approached him and they said, we will build our sheepfolds for our livestock here and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves, and these are the, the men, the leaders of this community, we ourselves will be armed, hurrying ahead of the sons of Israel until we have brought them to their place. While our little ones live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land, we will not return to our homes until every one of the sons of Israel has gained possession of his inheritance. But we will not have an inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has come to us on this side of the Jordan, toward the east. So Moses said to them, well, if you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for war, and all of you armed men cross the Jordan before the Lord uh, until he has driven his enemies out in front of him, the land is subdued before the Lord, then afterward you may return and be free of obligation toward the Lord and toward Israel. And this land shall be yours as property before the Lord. But if you do not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure that your sin will, will find you out. Build yourselves cities for your little ones and sheepfolds for your sheep, and do what you have promised. Then the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben spoke to Moses, saying, your servants will do just as my Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our livestock, and all our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead. While your servants, that is, everyone who is armed for war, cross over in the presence of the Lord to battle, just as the Lord says. So Moses gave the command, regarding them to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua son of Nun, to the heads of the fathers, uh, household of the tribes of the sons of Israel, and Moses said unto them, If the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben, everyone who's armed for battle, cross over with you and over the Jordan in the presence of the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead as their property. But if they do not cross over, they shall instead be settled among you in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We ourselves will cross over armed in the presence of the Lord in the land of Canaan. And the property of our inheritance shall remain with us across the Jordan. So they agreed to this. Then they went to battle. And if they kept their word, they didn't just go to battle, but they led the battles. They went to the front lines. And they fought valiantly. And they did that for the whole book of Joshua, however long that is. And I don't know how many years that is, but it's three or four or five or ten. I don't know how, long, how many years the book of Joshua is in length. But for that whole book, they're away from their wives and children. They're fighting the battles. They're leading the battles, helping to win the rest of the promised land for their brethren in Israel. Then we come to Joshua 22. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have done all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given them rest, as he promised, return to your homes. In the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. To love the Lord your God. To walk in obedience to him. To keep his commands. To hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away. And they went to their homes. To the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given land in Bashan. To the other half of the tribe, Joshua gave land to the west side of the Jordan along with their fellow Israelites. When Joshua sent them home, he blessed them, saying, Return to your homes with your great wealth, with large herds of livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and a great quantity of clothing, and divide the plunder from your enemies with your fellow Israelites. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh and Canaan 
to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. Now, now we come to a wrinkle. When they came to the border, uh, the border town of Galiloth, on the bank of the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an immense altar by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Galiloth near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. They were concerned. They did not like that. They did not like that they went and built an altar. And they didn't understand why this nation, the, all these men, uh, on their way home had stopped and built an altar, but they didn't build it in their own land. They built it in Israel. They built it on the, the west bank of the Jordan. And they were ready to, to, to fight about that. They didn't, they didn't know what was going on, but they didn't like it. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With him they sent ten of the chief men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, each the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. When they went to Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, The whole assembly of the Lord says, How could you break faith? With the God of Israel like this, how could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us? Up to this very day, we have not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord. And are you now turning away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the whole community of Israel. If the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves, other than the altar of the Lord our God. When Achan, son of Zerah, was unfaithful in regard to the devoted things, did not wrath come on the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh replied to the head of the clans of Israel, The Mighty One, God, the Lord. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, He knows. And let Israel know, If this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord and to offer burnt offerings and grains or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us to account. No. We did it for fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, What do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, you Reubenites and Ganites, you have no share in the Lord. So your descendants might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. That is why we said, let us get ready and build an altar, but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us, between us and you and the generations that follow that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. And we said, if they ever say this to us or to our descendants, we will answer, look at the replica of the Lord's altar, which our ancestors built, not for burnt offerings and sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings, and sacrifices, other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. 
When Phinehas, the priests, and the leaders of the community, the heads of the clans of the Israelites, heard what Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priests, said to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is with us, because you have not been unfaithful to the Lord in this matter. Now you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Then Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan from their meeting with the Reubenites, the Gadites, in Gilead, and reported to the Israelites. They were glad to hear the report and praise God. And they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites lived. And the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. Isn't this interesting? And I'll tell you why, why this is so interesting to me right now. Because here we are teaching on giving. I've been teaching on giving for a few weeks now. And here we have this story where the Reubenites and the Gadites and half-tribe of Manasseh, they're leaving the company of their brethren on the west of the Jordan, going back to the east of the Jordan, to go back to their homes, go back to their families, go back to their estates, their livestock, their livelihood. But they want to maintain solidarity with the brethren that they've been at war with, or they've been at war beside, their comrades at arms. And in order to establish that solidarity, in order to, to do something significant, to make a gesture, to say, hey, we're still you. We're leaving, but we're still you. We're still family. We're still the same. We're still brethren. What is it that they have in common? What have we got in common with our brothers? What's the most important thing that we have with them? And what did they choose? The Ten Commandments? Nope. Nope. Circumcision? Nope. Their heritage, their children being children of Abraham? No, they didn't hide to that. Did they appeal to Moses as their lawgiver? Look, we all have Moses in common. No. Nope. Did they appeal to their common heritage as slaves? To their 400 years of suffering together? Nope, they didn't say a word about that. Did they talk about their dietary code, their dietary restrictions? Nope. Nothing about that. Their head coverings, their prayer shawls, their haircuts? Nope, none of that. What is it that we have in common with all of our brethren in Israel? Our giving. We give to the Lord. This is what will unite us with our brothers. We'll build a replica of the altar, the place where giving is done. We'll build this huge statue that looks just like the altar. And this will let them know for sure, we haven't left you, brothers. You're still one of us. We're still one of you. Because we're one in our giving. That's how they identified themselves. That was what they thought made them most unique. That's what made them a peculiar people. We are a peculiar people. We are those who give. And this shouldn't surprise us. You know, you look at the book of Deuteronomy, and you, you go through that, that whole book, if you read it and don't just skim it, which, you know, Deuteronomy is a tough read. I, I think it's the hardest of the Pentateuch. I think Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, even Numbers, much more interesting. 
much easier to read than Deuteronomy. If you look at the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 1 through 4, you've got a history of the covenant. Chapters 5 through 25, you've got the law reiterated. Uh, chapter 5, the Ten Commandments. Chapter 6, love the Lord. Chapter 7, sanctify yourselves. Chapters 8 through 11, the importance of obeying God's commands. Chapters 12 through 18, instructions for worship, the great majority of which has to do with giving, by the way. Chapter 19, Cities of Refuge. Chapter 20, Preparations for War. Chapters 21 through 25, Various Laws. And then, Chapter 26, you begin a new section. What we have in Chapter 26 of the Book of Deuteronomy is new information. Everything up to that point had been review. Everything up to that point had been a, a rehearsal, had been a reiteration of the law a reiteration of other things that had already been said in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Up to this point, all the instructions of Moses that he had given had been general instructions on how the children of Israel were to conduct themselves as a matter of ongoing policy. And in chapter 26, there's a shift. Chapter 26, Moses rolls up his sleeves for his final huddle before the big game. People are getting ready to go to war. You read through the book of Deuteronomy, there's a clear break between chapters 25 and 26. The air, chapter 26, is like William Prescott saying, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. It's like Newt Rockney saying, win one for the Gipper, for the Gipper. Or William Wallace rallying his armies before the battle cry. Or Winston Churchill saying, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. What is Moses' rallying cry? What is Moses' call to arms? How does Moses prepare Joshua's troops for battle? What is his legacy? What is Moses' farewell address, his parting shot? What is his I have a dream speech? Deuteronomy 26, verse 1, when you have entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it. Take a portion of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land of the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land of the Lord that the Lord swore to our forefathers to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our Father, and the Lord heard our, our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With great terror, with miraculous signs and wonders, he brought us to this place, and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. And then the rest of the chapter is instructions on what to do with that offering, how to offer it, how to give it, what to say. The first order of business for the children of Israel once they entered Canaan was to be giving. That shouldn't come as any surprise to us. Giving is always first. First in ordinance and first in priority. What's the first act of worship recorded in the Bible? Giving, Cain and Abel. What's the very first thing Noah did after coming out of the ark? He gave. He set up an altar and made a sacrifice to the Lord. What's the first thing Abraham did after God came to him at Haran and called him to leave his family? He gave. Genesis 12, 4 through 7. 
After Abraham had surveyed the land of Canaan, he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. What's the first thing Abraham did when he met Melchizedek on his way back from the War of the Nine Kings? He gave. What's the first thing Jacob did after his uh, dream of the ladder going up to heaven? He gave. When God had humbled the Egyptians with the ten plagues so that they came to realize that Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, was God indeed, what was their first response? To give. They showered the people of God with rich gifts and clothing and jewelry as they left. What was the first thing Joshua did after the fall of Ai? He gave. He set up an altar. Joshua 8, 30-31. What was Gideon's first response when the angel of the Lord first appeared to him? To give. He said to the angel, please do not depart from here until I come and bring out my present and set it before you. What was Jephthah's first instinct when he returned from battle victorious over over Sion? To give. Now, he's been roundly criticizing for making it, criticized for making an open-ended vow, which resulted in him having to dedicate his daughter to the Lord. But I'm convinced that his vow neither required nor, nor resulted in the death of his daughter. If Jephthah actually sacrificed his daughter to the Lord, he was a fool. Leviticus 27.7 gives him an out from that, releases him from his vow. There's a... Uh, there's another passage as well that can release us from releasing from his vow. The point is, is that his first instinct was to give. What was Hannah's first response when Samuel was born? To give. As soon as he was weaned, she brought him to the Lord and gave him along with several other sacrifices. It's the first thing David did when God returned the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. He gave. Second Samuel six seventeen. What was the first, when we first meet Job, in the book of Job, we're told that he's a righteous man. And what's the evidence that the text give us? What's the, what's the proof that Job is righteous? Well, he gives. He makes regular sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of his children. What's the first thing Joseph and Mary did when Jesus was born? They gave. When Jesus was eight days old, they dedicated him to the Lord and made sacrifices according to the law. What's the first thing the wise men did when they met Jesus? They gave. In the Sermon on the Mount, what's the first thing Jesus tells us to do? To perform our righteousness. He says, when you do your righteousness, do it in secret. And then he talks about three different acts of righteousness. What's the first one? Giving. Prayer and fasting are the second and third. Now, I could give more examples, but no more needed. You get the idea. We've been studying the book of Acts. And the book of Acts records the earliest Christians and their behavior, the early church. And what does it tell us at the end of chapter 2 and at the end of chapter 4 was their response to the gospel? It says they were, they were full, filled with grace, filled with wonder and awe. What did they do? They gave. They sold all their belongings and put their money at the apostles' feet. Everywhere you look, Old Testament and New Testament, First in God's priorities, and first in the priorities of the faithful. That's who God wants his people to be. And that's who we are. That's who we ought to be. A people who gives. You look at that Old Testament record, and you look at those Reubenites and Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and they thought about it, and they had a long, a long time to think about it. What do we do to make peace with our brethren when we leave? What do we do to signify to them that, hey, it's still us? 
we're still together. We're, we're still one of you. You're still one of us. They made a monument to their giving. That's my lesson for today.